All right, welcome, welcome. So today we're entering a whole new module on disease. And the first lecture is population genetics. So um, here we are, this is module four. We talked about already basic foundations of how to parse genomes, how to align genomes, uh, focusing on the primary DNA sequence. Then we looked at the dynamics of the genome, looking at gene expression, epigenomics, and then how we can use these to infer networks and how we can understand these networks, both through um, inference of networks as well as uh, learning of probabilistic networks and neural networks. Today, we're applying all of this knowledge that we have accumulated to the study of human disease. So first, we're gonna talk about population genetics and the foundations of genetic variation across individuals. Then on Thursday, we're gonna talk about disease associations. So bringing in phenotype and looking at how phenotypic differences between individuals relate with um, genetic differences. Then we're gonna talk about quantitative trait mapping and specifically for molecular phenotypes. So how intermediate phenotypes mediate the impact of genetic variation disease. And then we're gonna talk about heritability, about systems genetics, about how we can understand genetic variation at the systems level across millions of regions simultaneously. And then module five is in comparative genomics and evolution. And then module six is the frontiers, uh, the, the current uh, research direction. So this is this module, population genetics, disease association mapping, quantitative trait mapping, and heritability. So first, we're gonna talk about the foundations of genetic variation. I'll give you a brief history of the last, oh, 3,000 years of genetics. And then we're gonna talk about sort of the basic building blocks of genetic variation. What, are, what is this variation? How do we detect it? How do we call variants? Then we're gonna talk about how this variation is organized into blocks known as haplotypes, separated by boundaries known as recombination hotspots within regions of linkage disequilibrium and how we can phase, we can align uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms from one haplotype to another haplotype. Then we're gonna talk about human relatedness and painting of ancestry by looking at population differences. Then we're, uh, we're gonna look at briefly human demographic history and how we came out of Africa and spread to the rest of the planet. And lastly, how we can actually measure human selection at multiple timescales and we're gonna introduce some basic population genetics um, foundations. Everybody with me? Who's excited? Yay, awesome. All right, so the last 3,000 years of genetics, more like 10,000 years of genetics. So um, genetics goes back a long, long time. Uh, you've seen what sheep look like uh, today. This is not an accident. This was uh, due to selection. Basically, selective breeding of animals led to uh, you know, animals with extremely beneficial properties, such as massive amounts of wool, uh, or uh, starting from something that's totally not even chewable to something that is the number one source of calories in the United States, so corn. Um, or starting from something that will eat you to something that will you know, sort of wait with their tongue sticking out until you come back and wait by the door and lick your paws and stuff like that. I mean, it's just crazy, the fact that these dramatic differences have happened well, well before we knew about DNA even, or uh, the, the foundation of inheritance. So selective breeding of animals and plants and the concept of inheritance of eye color and hair color was understood for more than 10,000 years. Uh, then, when science came about, uh, primarily in ancient Greece, uh, a lot of folks started hypothesizing about what could be going on, what could be the molecular basis or the, you know, sort of physical instantiation of this inheritance. And, uh, you know, Anaximander and Aristotle reasoned about inheritance, about, you know, the passing of genetic traits. And Anaximander had a very modern view of evolution. He basically postulated that the first human was likely born from non-human relatives and that land animals most likely had a fish origin. This is something that, you know, a lot of adults have trouble with nowadays. Um, so it's, it's quite ahead of his time. And then Aristotle, in fact, built the first taxonomy of species. He basically classified all species and um, then, you know, the whole conceptualization of seedlings, the fact that information, genetic information is passed on 
from generation to generation was built up through a series of philosophers. Back in 450 BC, that's two and a half thousand years ago, Empedocles uh, basically postulated that the random mixing of traits and natural variation would be leading to the successful survival of the fittest, effectively, um, which would be misinterpreted, he reasoned, as purpose. And <laughs> this is way ahead of his time because Darwin wouldn't come for another 2,000 years to basically postulate that what we perceive as purpose and adaptation in a very Lamarckian kind of way is in fact just due to random mixing of alleles and selection of the fittest ones. And then Epicurus basically um, was the first to say that uh, a purely naturalistic basis uh, of this generation of diversity was possible without calling into supernatural intervention, okay? So, this is, again, way ahead of their time. Um, by contrast, there were a lot of other people like Plato and the Stoics and religion and Christianity that basically instead sort of did not reason rationally about the emergence of this diversity, but instead sort of brought in divine intervention. Um, in the 19th century, there were uh, massive amounts of change in the thinking about sort of inheritance and genetics. So Lam Lamarck was... Um, having this concept of this complexity force that was pushing species to change and this spontaneous generation of very simple life forms and that innately there's some life force that drives complexity. And that's when Darwin comes in. He basically says, wait a minute, there, you know, through his voyages, he basically realized that there's a continuum of species, that random mutation is probably what's leading to this diversity and that natural selection of the fitness uh, landscape, on the fitness landscape is basically what's leading to these adaptations that we're observing. But there were a lot of problems with Darwin's theory. So he believed in blending inheritance. So where the entire body would send information to uh, the, the gemules uh, through the egg and eventually, you know, this would map to the uh, embryo. So this is quite impossible uh, to implement with the discrete inheritance that we're seeing today. And this is also making his very theory impossible because through this, you would only have blending. You would never have selection of these traits because every progeny would be a blending of its um, uh, you know, parents. And that's where genetics is born, okay? So uh, Mendel, uh, only seven years later, basically came up with this concept of particulate inheritance, this quantum inheritance, if you wish. I mean, we all know that the world is quantum if you go way, way, way deep down, but we don't observe these quantum effects because they get averaged out. So classical, you know, mechanics and the physics, Newtonian physics still applies at our scale. But if you go way down, the quantum scale applies. In the same way, genetics can basically lead to uh, this continuum of phenotypes that was observed by Darwin and others. Um, but at the core lies a quantum inheritance, a particular inheritance where there is no blending, where basically you either have one allele or the other allele. And then these combinations through the laws of dominance and recessivity, through these discrete units, which later became known as genes, and through this independent assortment of different locations in what we now call chromosomes uh, with recombination sort of breaking up their inheritance would effectively be lead to this digital form of inheritance, okay? The problem, of course, is that Mendel um, was ignored for about 50 years. So he sent a letter with his paper to Darwin when Darwin was struggling to get his theory accepted because of this weird uh, blending inheritance problem, and Mendel was having a trouble getting anyone to believe in his theory because of this continuum of observable traits in the human population due to largely polygenic inheritance, that letter sat unopened <laughs> on Darwin's desk and was found still unopened on his desk after his death. And I think that blending these two theories 50 years earlier would have led to a much uh, faster um, evolution of uh, genetics. So anyway, basically for about 50 years, a lot of people struggled to accept either theory 
And uh, the reason for that was that the whole biometric school was looking at this continuous phenotypic variation. And uh, many others were arguing about saltationism, where you know, big things would happen in short time. Orthogenesis, vitalism, this vital force. Uh, Neo-Lamarckism, picking up these ideas, and all kinds of other um, uh, ideas of evolution. So the major next advance that led to modern genetics as we know it is uh, this modern synthesis, which began uh, by many accounts by R. A. Fisher, a statistician who basically realized that continuous phenotypic variation could be explained simply by multiple Mendelian loci. And that is fundamental. The fact that there is discrete particulate quantum, you know, inheritance, but you have many, many different locations, loci, all contributing together to create what we observe as a continuum phenotypic contribution through their additive, tiny additive effects. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Awesome. You feel like you've learned something so far? Okay, good. Um, so, um, that basically led to still the models of genetics and polygenic inheritance that we use today. Really, not much has happened in genetics since Fisher, I have to admit. Um, but we eventually found the molecular basis of all that. And again, in 1902, with microscopy techniques, we could actually start recognizing chromosomes. And DNA as this thing that makes, you know, um, your um, material get cloudy uh, and the concept of a genetic material. But it wasn't until 1953 that uh, the structure of DNA was resolved and it was clear that it formed the basis of inheritance. Basically, um, proteins, because they have an alphabet of 20 different letters, were thought to be the only possible carrier of genetic information because DNA was just so simple and boring. So it couldn't possibly be doing that. So there was a lot of debate. Um, and when the structure of the DNA was solved with this double helix and self-complementarity, it was finally realized that, hey, this is the basis of inheritance. Uh, and then the concept of linkage mapping happened also very, very early on. So in the lab of Morgan, uh, Sturtevant was basically his student who was basically looking at the uh, distances, at the, sorry, not at the distances, but at the recombination rates between genetic uh, traits and the, the location of these genetic traits could in fact be mapped in a linear order that would explain all of the pairwise distances. So this is specifically the deviation that was breaking Mendel's law of independent assortment. So Mendel has been argued to have parsed his data, although there's some controversy about that, whether he did or not, did not, about the counts of P's of different colors that he would find in different traits to basically better match independent assortment. And in fact, those deviations is exactly what led to linkage mapping. The fact that two things are slightly non-independent if they get closer and closer to each other. And that this non-independence can be quantified and mapped into genetic distances, giving a linear order to the genetic traits, which as you notice, was done you know, a good 40 years before the structure of the DNA was even solved. So, that basically led to a dramatic revolution in the 80s when we could start mapping Mendelian traits through families using exactly this approach, which was worked out almost 70 years earlier. Okay? And here you guys are today, <laughs> where you can just type any SNP in the genome, look up its variation, download the entire human genome, get your genome sequence for $1,000, get your genotypes for $99. Um, it is ridiculous how far we've come in just a couple of decades since you know, um, the beginning of sequencing of DNA to modern day. Basically, you look at these thousands of years that it took to even conceptualize what's going on with inheritance, and now in just a, sh a few short decades, the fields have just exploded. So that's why I think you should all be uh, feeling very fortunate <laughs> to be alive at a time 
when we don't worry and wonder about the magic of stuff anymore, but we can rationally understand the molecular basis of human diversity, human disease, inheritance, evolution, and so on and so forth. So where are we now? We basically are able to catalog the entire human genome. We have built variation maps that catalog within many populations the basic common variants. We understand the concept of haplotypes, which even just a few years ago was not uh, fully worked out. We understand the concept of genetic association, of common and rare variants, and all of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. Okay? So where we are today is that we have successfully mapped thousands, actually 120,000 regions in the genome, 120,000 regions that have common variants associated with disease. And we can build these plots that basically tell you where are those variants. And the next challenge is how do we bring in all of the information that you've learned in the first three modules to systematically understand disease? Okay, so that's going to be the focus of this fourth module. Who's excited? Awesome. No pressure. But, you know, there's 120,000 variants that you need to understand systematically. So that's the scope of the challenge. We basically have in every cell of the human body, two copies of the genome, 23 chromosomes, about 20,000 protein coding genes, probably a similar number of non-coding genes, and 3.2 billion letters. And we have millions of polymorphic sites. So what we're going to talk about, you know, in the next few lectures is how do we understand this variation, catalog this variation, map this variation, associate this variation with phenotypic variation, and ultimately understand the molecular basis of uh, human disease. So let's start with the foundations. So basically 99.9% uh, .9 of DNA is actually shared between any two individuals. Okay, when people are at war with each other, you should tell them, guys, you're almost identical. Um, it's not good for your genes, don't kill each other. Um, a variation in the remaining, about 0.1% of the genome, explains all our predisposition to disease. It's conceptually mind-boggling to realize how little variation there is, and yet how much our predispositions differ uh, the remaining phenotypic variation is, of course, environmental and also stochastic. You know, stuff happens. <clears throat> uh, so let's talk about the different types of variation that we're going to talk about in this lecture. So first, we're going to talk about SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Poly means many, morph means form, polymorphism means something that has many forms. So single nucleotide polymorphism means a location in the genome which is polymorphic, which has many variations, many alleles, okay? We're gonna be talking about the G allele and the C allele at that locus. Ready with me? There's about one of those every thousand bases, okay? They're very, very common. And most of those come from Africa. Most of those are extremely ancient and shared by all populations on the planet. We were about a group of 10,000 people that's where most of our genetic variation that we still have today was created. And then we sort of exploded to the 6 billion people that we are now, largely keeping most of that tiny little variation. So if, you, if, if an alien came over and picked two people on the planet and sequenced them and then asked, well, how many, can I estimate the number of people on the planet? He would still say about 10,000. He would not say 6 billion. We still have the genetic variation of an interbreeding population with random mixing of about 10,000 people. It's, it's remarkable. That's <coughs> SNPs. Then insertions and deletions, abbreviated as in DELs, uh, account for one every 10,000 bases of a difference. Okay? And then the way we represent those, instead of having a blank with TATGG, which is inserted, we basically just represent them as C or CTATGG. Okay? Then, Short tandem repeats, or STRs, are basically repeated units of, you know, two or three or four or five nucleotides, okay? So these STRs also come about one every 10,000 bases. And then lastly, there's the elephants in the room, which are structural variants and copy number variants. So S CNVs and SVs. These are big deletions, duplications, or inversions 
and there's about one of those every million bases. Everybody with me so far? So why are these important? Because if you make a single change to a DNA letter, you might end up with a dramatic disease, okay? If you look at uh, this single change, RS189, 107, 123, it changes, um, oops, I'm, I don't know, I'm showing the wrong one here, I apologize. Um, but basically, the, so ignore this part, but basically single cell anemia is based on a single change from um, GAG into GTG, okay? A single letter. This happens to be in a protein coding region. These are much, much more rare than um, SNPs in non-coding regions by factors of thousands. And this basically changes a glutamic acid into a valine, which is a pretty dramatic change. And it basically causes um, blood cells to sickle, to basically you know, flatten out and not be able to carry oxygen as well, okay? So um, you know, this is a common mutation, and that's weird. Why would such a pathogenic mutation be common? You guys probably know the answer. Because it leads to resistance to malaria. Basically, if you'd rather have sickle cell anemia or malaria, you'll do sickle cell anemia by far. Uh, and in Africa, exactly in the location, in the ge geographic location where you have uh, malaria uh, prevalent, you also have a much higher frequency of this particular mutation, which has then, of course, spread to the rest of the uh, population uh, and is now associated with sickle cell anemia. So, there's, uh, so these, are, these, these are the building blocks of most of what we're gonna talk about in the next few lectures. So SNPs, there's millions of them, and they're very, very frequent, okay? So they're uh, you know, almost a factor of a thousand more frequent than big deletions, and a factor of 10 more frequent than STRs or uh, impacts. So GWAS, genome-wide association studies, expression quantitative trait locus studies, EQTL studies, will all focus on these SNPs and these small indels. And they very often have two alleles. These are the two states. They're identified by some RSID. So here's the RSID of you know, this SNP on the genome. And then the submitted sequences contain a variant and they're clustered to build a database. And dbSNP contains all SNPs in, that are common in the human genome. So there's more than 100 million known variants in dbSNP. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a, such a good question. Um, we will talk about that at length, but generally when you talk about an allele, it's an allele of whatever you're talking about. If you're talking about a SNP, there's two alleles on that SNP. If you're talking about a haplotype, there's multiple alleles with that haplotype. Does that make sense? So basically, an allele simply means one version or another version. So you could talk about a version of a car model, a version of a boat, a version of a SNP, or a version of a whole haplotype. Does that answer your question? So basically, when we talk allele, it's usually in the context of whatever we were talking about, and it just means version. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 10,000 people. But millions of SNPs. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Correct, correct. If we were increasing linearly and still intermixing, then the variation would be higher. But because there have been so many bottlenecks, we just took a small chunk of the variation that was in Africa and then we spread them in all of Europe. And another little chunk, and we spread it in all of Asia, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's, you know, most of the variants are preceding this explosion in population size. That's why if you look at the amount of variation today, you would think that we're still a small population. But mutations have continued to arise at the same rate. It's just that we spent a long time in Africa before we got out. So that's why over any interval of time, the same number of mutations arise. And then they spread in the population in different ways. 
but the new European mutations are only found in Europe. The new Asian mutations are only found in Asia. Does that make sense? And I shouldn't say in Europe, I should say in European ancestry chromosomes and in Asian ancestry chromosomes, because these chromosomes have now spread through the planet because of you know, our ability to travel and mate and so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? Great. Uh, question? No. You guys always have good conversations, so if you ask it loud, I'm sure it'll be interesting. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's an exception. Um, all right, raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome, do you feel like you're learning stuff? Yeah, good. Raise your hands if you feel like you're learning stuff. Yeah, no, yeah, okay, good. good. Um, all right, so, alleles. What do we mean when we say allele? There's many ways to talk about alleles. So we can talk about alleles at the SNP level, at the haplotype level, and usually we're gonna to refer to the different alleles in different ways. We might refer to the reference allele or the alternate allele, the major or the minor, the risk or the protective, the ancestral or the derived. So this, I mean, there's just many, many ways of distinguishing the two alleles. One of them is, did that dude from Buffalo, who became the reference human genome, uh, have that allele or not? And that's really just a random person on the planet who was picked as the donor to construct the reference human genome. Okay? So this has absolutely no biological implication, except for the fact that reference alleles will happen at roughly the frequency with which you would expect them in any random individual on the planet. Okay? And the alternate allele just simply happens to be the one that that person didn't have. Because that person didn't randomly have all the disease alleles, the alternate allele will typically be the risk allele, and the reference allele will typically be the protective allele. But again, it's, an, it's a simplification. You could also ask about which allele is more frequent in the population. Basically, whether it's the major allele, which is the more frequent one, or the minor allele. But of course, that has a problem because if the person who got out of Africa and spread their genes into Europe had the minor allele, that minor allele might now be the major allele in Europe. Or if whoever left from, you know, I don't know, um, Polynesia to populate Australia had now what was the major allele in Asia, but the minor allele in Africa, but again, make it the minor allele in Australia. Okay, everybody with me? So basically, the major and the minor allele are extremely population specific. We can also talk about the ancestral and the derived allele. So basically, if we match the most common ancestor between human and chimp, you may be able to talk about ancestral versus derived. But the problem is that this is not well defined in every location because there are some segments that have been lost in chimp. Okay, so ancestral and derived is not fully defined everywhere. And then you could also talk about the disease association, risk or non-risk, okay? So one allele might cause cancer and the other allele might be protective of cancer, okay? But the problem with that as well is that it's very phenotype dependent. I mean, if we're talking about malaria, should we be calling this the risk allele or the protective allele? Because it depends on the environment, okay? So basically the disease association is also phenotype specific, which can also be environment specific. Okay, sounds good? That's why we have all these words. That's why there's no single reference because depending on the context of what you're talking about, you will want to refer to the reference, the alternate, the major, the minor, the ancestral, the derived, the risk, or the non-risk. Sounds good? We also classify variants based on their minor allele frequency. So it's much easier to only, always talk about the minor allele frequency because frankly, it just caps out at 50%. Um, so we're going to be talking about common variants if about one person out of 20 has them, okay? We're going to we'll talk about low frequency variants if it's between 5% and, five, sorry, 0.5% and 5% of the population. Rare variants if it's less than 0.5%. And then private variants if basically that person has them. Or if they're a de novo variant where not even their parents have them. It's just a new mutation that happened in that uh, in, in that lineage. Um, and we could even talk about a somatic mutation where less than one person has it. So a new mutation that happened during my cell divisions that is not my brain, that's a somatic mutation. That's less than one person. Okay? Everybody with me so far? So basically, huge range of frequencies. So here's one example. We're going to be talking about this, you know, allele, the reference allele is C, the minor allele is G, it has a frequency of 0.03, and the ancestral allele is unknown just because Chimp has lost it. 
Everybody with me? Great. So now um, it's important to recognize where are these frequencies coming from. The frequencies are coming on one hand from the history of these alleles. On the other hand, they're capped by the functional impact of those alleles. Okay. The history of those alleles means that something that is very recent is probably also very rare, just because it probably hasn't had time to rise to, full, to high frequency. Everybody with me on that one? But some ancestral alleles can also be very rare. And the reason for that could be simply stochastic. As they go through the population, they just didn't happen to spread as rapidly. Or they might actually be functional. And the reason is that they are detrimental. So if you look at a lot of these disease-associated alleles, they're usually the minor allele frequency. And the very strong effect alleles are usually at very, very low frequencies. Okay? And you can think about this relationship between allele frequency and effect size as, as this inverse relationship. The more common an allele is, the less likely it is to have a strong effect. And if an allele has a strong effect, it is very likely to be rare. And the reason for that is that as you start, if, a, if a, an allele has a strong effect, as it starts getting more common, evolutionary selection will bring it down in frequency. Yeah. How does that you could think of effect at many different levels. You can think of effect at the disease level. In other words, um, the way that we'll think about it the most often is in the context of a genome-wide association study. We're going to say, uh, if you have this SNP, you have an 8% chance of having the disease. If you don't have this SNP, you have a 6% chance, or this, this allele of the SNP, then you have a 6% chance. So the effect size is 8 divided by 6, about 1.2 or something. Does that make sense? Yeah. So basically, 1.2 would be right around here. Okay. And for some alleles, you might have a 50-fold higher risk. So basically, if you have that, you know, allele, you have a 54-fold higher chance. Okay. So that's how it's quantified. But you can think of it again. It depends on the context. When we talked about when we talk about GWAS, it'll be the disease. When we talk about QTLs, eQTLs, expression quantitative trait loci, it'll be the gene expression level. So individuals that have a G may have, you know, a fourfold higher expression level than the individuals that have an A at the same location. Any other questions? Yes. So, uh, yeah, we're going to flip around the effect. So basically, if your, you know, uh, if it's protective by, if your risk goes from 100%, from 30% to 20%, we're still going to talk about effect between one and more. Yeah. So basically, it's just the ratio of whichever number is greater. Any other questions? Yeah. Maybe I'll just note some of this background is really active to that you have some rare alleles that cause disease, but in actuality, um, you can't really have that allele and then, right? Yeah. Um, so. Is there any thought or attempts to do a better name to try to see if, like, at what point is there a drop off of yeah. So we talked about deep learning uh, methods to quantify the genetic effect, uh, the, the, regula the gene regulatory effect of genetic variation uh, on <coughs> yesterday, uh, basically last Thursday, according to the schedule. Um, and um, the that method can be used to now scan the entire human genome for what would be the effect of a ton of mutations that we haven't even observed and what is the effect of those mutations that we do observe. And it's a very cool final project. <laughs> I don't think anybody has systematically said, what are the mutations we don't even see because they're so bad? And the answer is, um, as we start quantifying genetic variation in the human population, you will see that it's dramatically depleted in protein coding regions because they have huge effects. So, um, yeah, that's a very, very good question. So basically, below this level, they're just the, you know, evolution won't even let you have a fetus with, with that mutation. <laughs>
And if you think about it, it's quite remarkable that all of us are sitting around, right? And talking about science and all of that stuff. Like that means we have functioning limbs, functioning internal organs, functioning brains. I mean, it's incredible that all of these things went right. And if you think about how do you guarantee that? I mean, there's mothers that have never lost a baby, but if you lose a baby, which is horrible and tragic, it probably means that you're probably avoiding some mutations, that, that there may be some genetic mutations that did not lead to the baby developing. So in the first trimester, you don't even tell your friends that you're having a baby. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of selection that happens in even sort of getting to that stage, getting to a full successful pregnancy, living through the first few years of their life. I mean, you know, in uh, ancient times, people wouldn't even give names to their babies until a few years later, because so many babies would be lost. And we've come a long way in terms of being able to cope with so many environmental risks and so many in utero risks and so many genetic risks. And it's accumulation, it's an accumulation of all these things. So many of the mutations we don't even see may actually exist in the sperm or in the egg and just might never meet, make it to the fetus. And if you also think about the numbers game that the male lineage is playing, there's gazillions of sperm swimming and some of them have a lot of motility problems. Many of the genes that are expressed in the brain are also expressed in the testes. Why? Well, probably some functional convergence of being able to sort of, you know, use actin and sort of spread out and, you know, form the brain, et cetera. But also there's a huge number of genes that are expressed in the testes. Part of the reason might be making sure that if there's going to be a misfolded protein, you just get rid of that sperm altogether. So you don't have to lose a pregnancy. So you can lose a huge number of sperm before they even make it to the egg and therefore sort of trim out that spectrum of the distribution much, much earlier. Um, on the female lineage, there's very few eggs in their lifetime. So there's many fewer divisions. Whereas on the male lineage, we produce massive amounts of spermatozoids, which basically requires a huge, huge number of cell divisions and therefore many, many more mutations on the male lineage. So that's why women that don't have to play that, that game. Instead, they make you know, few eggs and very well. And pretty much everything that my wife does, the fewer things are much better. And so I can see that you know, this doesn't just go to the gonads, but uh, <laughs> much more rapidly. Anyway, so, <laughs> so um, basically, and now if you ask, are there rare alleles with strong effects? Uh, sorry, are there common alleles with strong effects? There's very few examples. And usually that's because an environmental change happened that initially selected for that to be the protective allele and then changes in the environment led to that being the um, risk allele. I carry two copies of the obesity risk locus for FTO that make me seven pounds heavier than would be otherwise. I call my mom every Saturday and I'm like, uh, <laughs> So, so um, Basically, uh, why is this so frequent in the European population? So 42% of European, percent of European chromosomes carry the risk allele for obesity in that FTO locus. And the reason is that starvation was a much higher risk of death than obesity when that allele was selected. So it's not unreasonable that in a different environmental uh, situation, being able to store way more calories from your diet was actually beneficial. And, and today, when we have way more access to food uh, than uh, opportunities to exercise, um, you know, that balance is shifted. So that's why there's very few examples of this. And usually you should think of this in the context of changing environmental uh, situation. What about this side? Why aren't there rare variants of small effects? And the reason is that there's a second ascertainment bias of being able to detect them. So if something is very rare but strong effect, yeah, sure, you can detect it. You have sufficient powers. We're going to talk about on Thursday. If something is common and very small effect, sure, you can detect it as well. If you look at a big enough cohort, you will be able to find a statistical significant difference. But if something is rare and have a small, has a small effect, we just have no idea that it's even there. We just have no power. So there's plenty of stuff here. It's just you know, we don't even notice it and that's okay. Make sense? Everybody understands this picture fully? Awesome. So now 
if you basically ask what is that allele frequency, you know, things that are effectively causing the disease, that's, where, well, that's what we call Mendelian mutations. So he, this is Mendelian disease. This is usually what's picked up by GWAS. And then uh, there's a huge number of low frequency variants with intermediate effects. Okay. And now you should think also, why are we doing all this? Why are we discovering all this genetic variation? And unfortunately, there's a lot of misuse of genetics. A lot of people are going to say, hey, you know, sequence your DNA and then find out if you're going to have diabetes. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I have to say, it just doesn't work that way. And the reason for that is that for a lot of these complex traits, a lot of these complex disorders, the genetic variants that we can cumulatively see all added together have a very small effect on the overall phenotypic variation of that person. And the reason is that there are millions of genetic variants that are together contributing to that effect, as we're gonna talk about on Thursday. So we should think about where are we um, gaining information? And if you're looking at these common variants of weak effect, you're not gonna stop a person on the street and say, oh, give me your DNA, I'm gonna tell you if you're gonna have diabetes. That, it, you know, that, that is usually governed by small, rare variants of small effects. Sorry, common variants of small effects. But on that side, absolutely you can make a difference. You can basically say, well, I can tell you're gonna have sickle cell disease or Huntington's or you know, uh, Alzheimer's with APOE2 and APOE4 and so on and so forth. So um, at this end of the spectrum is where personalized medicine and personalized genomics comes in. At that side of the spectrum is where disease mechanism comes in, okay? So when we think about what is the impact of these two different sides of the spectrum, the personalized medicine side is really for strong effect variants. Everybody with me? And these are usually rare. So again, one mode, is informing therapeutic development, and that's down here. That's where we look for common variants, we build animal models, we do clinical trials based on the mechanisms that we've inferred, and then we sort of you know, learn something about biology. The personalized genomic medicine is at this side of the, of the spectrum. Sounds good? But both are super, super useful. It's just that this side is useful for the whole population, this side is useful for a, a one person at a time. Everybody with me? Okay. All right, so that's all for SNPs. Then there's tandem repeats and indels. So for example, we talked about Huntington's just now. If you have one, two, three, or four, or a few copies, then you're fine. If you have many copies, then you're guaranteed to have Huntington's. And if you have even more copies, you're guaranteed to have Huntington's earlier, okay? So this basically leads to this abnormal Huntington protein. Uh, ironically, we still don't know exactly what Huntington actually does. This was just some hypothetical ORF uh, at the time, and um, it's now known as Huntington, but uh, mutant Huntington is known to lead to brain degeneration, but the exact mechanism through which it acts is still not known. Uh, cystic fibrosis is an example of an indel, so basically, uh, you know, the cystic fibrosis gene, CFTR, uh, basically lung, leads to these lung infections and um, the, you know, the mechanism is this indel that basically changes the length of that protein. All right, so um, back to the basics of how do we even represent and store these genetic variants. Humans are diploid, every individual carries two homologous copies, and therefore carrying two copies of each variant, uh, you know, will be easily represented as, you know, two. Carrying zero copies of the alternate allele can be represented as zero, and carrying one copy can be represented as one, okay? So most of the time, we're gonna be talking about genotypes. And my genotype is what combination of SNPs, do, of alleles do I have at every SNP position on my chromosome? That's my genotype. So basically, when 23andMe offers genotyping, they basically tell you zero, one, or two at every location, okay? They don't tell you whether, you know, these are on the same side or not. This is much, much harder to obtain. So basically, this is known as phasing, being able to take these genotypes and say, did this one come from dad or from mom? <laughs> 
it's much harder. So basically, your haplotype is this zero one for every location. What did the chromosome that mom or dad gave you contain? And then the genotype is what is the identity of your two alleles at every SNP location? Raise your hands if you're with me. Question. Yeah, I see two questions. Raise your hands first. Who's with me? Okay, good. Uh, go first and then second. How would you one way to do it would be to look I mean, again when you look at haplotypes they're usually multi allelic and then you can talk about each of the haplotypes as a number the way that we represent these SNPs in databases is a or g but um, for common variants and uh, you you will typically have only two alleles you, you rarely very rarely have three alleles. And the reason for that is that there are really three billion bases in the genome. The chance that in the however many generations I had two of these one in a million kind of hits hit the same spot out of three billion bases is very rare. So, and the chance that that second hit became frequent enough to become a polymorphism, a common polymorphism in the human population is also very rare. So basically, you have to think about these very small number of generations to these out of Africa events. And you have to think about the very, very low mutation rate of the human genome. And that together leads to almost every common variant being there in only two forms at most. As we're cataloging more and more rare variation, we're not gonna even talk about allele. We'll basically, we don't represent them this way anymore. We just simply say, here's the exact variant that you have. Does that make sense? Was that also your question? Great. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. All right, so experimentally, we can infer haplotypes, but it's very hard. You basically have to isolate individual chromosomes from that person and then run a SNP array on that one chromosome. But the problem is that we usually do this on a sample of blood, and therefore we have millions of cells and separating the same chromosome across millions of cells is very hard okay so what you need to do is single molecule sequencing in order to infer the actual haplotype or you could basically say what does mom have what does dad have at every location and computationally infer the haplotype structure or, or, or the haplotype uh, identity of each person okay so it's, current, it's experimentally possible, but currently infeasible to directly measure haplotypes for the whole genome. It's cheaper and much more efficient to measure genotypes where you're just simply counting minor alleles. And genotyping loses information, and therefore we need algorithms and statistical models to recover them, okay? And that's, uh, we're gonna talk about phasing and we're gonna talk about imputation. Everybody with me so far? Great. So, um, I mean, just to give you, anyway, we're going to get into that a lot more in the next section. Sounds good? So basically, everybody 100% clear the difference between a haplotype and a genotype? Awesome. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question. Suppose that this mutation here changes the beginning of my protein to make it non-functional. And that mutation here changes the end of the protein to make it non-functional. If I have both mutations in the maternal haplotype, it's okay, because I have dad's copy, which works just fine. If I have both, both mutations on dad's, it's okay, because I have mom's copy, which works just fine. But if mom's is broken at the beginning and dad's is broken at the end, I have zero functional copies of that protein, and I'm not fine. So in this very simple example, when the same protein is hit by two different SNPs, which are, of course, very rare um, and are very unlikely, um, it, it explains it. But most of the time, you may have a gene regulatory variation that causes this gene to be poorly expressed and a protein coding mutation or two different regulatory variations and so on and so forth. Does that answer your question? Great. It's a great question. Ask those questions. These are great. Really, really great questions. Any others? Okay. Awesome. All right, so 
how do we even catalog common genetic variation? Uh, we have to first sequence lots of individuals to discover the variants in the first place, then recognize which of the, these variants are common, and then combine these variants into haplotype blocks. Once you have these haplotype blocks, you can then genotype a much larger set of individuals. And the reason for that is that you've already mapped the common variation, so you don't have to do sequencing anymore. You can just do genotyping. And after that, you can estimate population specific properties. And the key projects that have done that is the haplotype map project, so mapping the haplotypes, or and the thousand genome project. Okay, and these largely followed each other. Everybody with me? Questions? No. Okay, so let's talk about how we discover variation. So you basically sequence a few individuals, like a thousand people out of six billion population. And then you basically say, well, I'm keep finding the same mutation in this in many different reads from the same person. That suggests that this person has a polymorphism. So I'm gonna add it to my catalog. And then if I find this over and over again across a bunch of individuals, I'm gonna basically understand its frequency. Everybody with me so far? So high throughput sequencing is very commonly used to measure molecular phenotypes, like phenotype expression, modification. And previously, we just ignored mismatches. We just were mapping the reads back to the genome. And the matches that were highly similar, but these might actually represent true sequence variation. So there are statistical methods that can distinguish true variation from errors. And that's a whole field of variant calling. Or basically, when do you decide that this is a systematic sequencing error versus this is truly a genetic variation? Everybody with me? So there's many uh, tools that have been built for doing that. A very popular and very widely used is the GATK uh, genotype color. It's basically using um, heuristic to find mismatches that are not simply explained by noise. And it uses an assembly graph to identify possible haplotypes. And for every haplotype, it basically says what is the probability of observing this particular mutation given some inferred haplotype using a probabilistic sequence alignment. It uses a Keter Markov model. The states are, is there an insertion? Is there a deletion? Is there a substitution? The emissions are pairs of aligned nucleotides or gaps. And then there's uh, transitions in that Keter Markov model that are equivalent to insertion, deletion, gap penalties from the smith waterman algorithm. And you, in the end, get a probability of observing a read given the haplotype, which you can reverse using Bayes' rule into the probability of a haplotype given the read. Okay, and then after you've done that, you basically assign genotypes to each sample based, based on a maximum a posteriori haplotype assignment. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome, great. So this is the foundations of a GATK. For exomes, you basically have a much more specialized problem because the mutations are much more rare and because you use a lot of targeted sequencing. So there's also specialized uh, pipelines for calling uh, mutations within protein coding exons. And the motivation is that there's very different sequencing properties. On one hand, they're much more rare. On the other hand, the composition at the nucleotide level and at the trinucleotide level is dramatically different within protein coding regions. So to address that, Atlas II basically developed this logistic regression classifier that trained data using a lot of um, uh, sequencing of exomes from the Thousand Genome Project. That was, I think, 30,000 exomes or more. Um, and then uh, true positives were reached where the mismatch was also discovered in the exome pilot, and then the true negative were the remaining reads, and the features were the mismatch quality score, the flanking quality score, whether neighboring nucleotides were swapped, the distance to the three prime end of the gene, because that's where the quality gets lower, and so on and so forth, okay? And that is, a heuristic algorithm, which is much, much faster than the full Bayesian model of, for example, haplotype color uh, and so on so forth. Okay. So using these tools, the Thousand Genomes Project went to, uh, you know, sequence individuals from many, many different places on the planet. And the reason for that is that they capture very different parts of the population variation in humans. If you look at Africa, these circles are much bigger because these have many more mutations. 
If you look at uh, Europe, these circles are much smaller because they have many fewer mutations. And most of those mutations were in fact brought in from Africa during the out of Africa event. If you can see here the coloring, these are mutations that are shared across continents. So more than half of the mutations that are now making up this big circle in Europe are in fact simply African mutations. They're, they're mutations that are found throughout the globe. Whereas if you look at Africa, only two thirds of the mutations here are shared with anyone else, with, with any other population on the planet. This is quite remarkable. It basically tells you that a big, big chunk of the human variation resides still to this day in Africa. And very little of that variation has actually spread out to the rest of the globe. Everybody with me so far? Great. So this is ridiculous because, uh, no, sorry, given this fact, it is ridiculous that the vast majority of genome-wide association studies are carried out in European populations because we're basically not capturing this huge repertoire of diversity in the human population in Africa that would make all of these studies much more powered. Okay. But anyway, so it's extremely important to basically understand variation in multiple continental backgrounds uh, and, and sort of otherwise we're only looking at a very small part of the picture. Everybody with me? All right. So once we have sequenced and identified and called what are true mutations and polymorphisms versus statistical noise, you can basically then ask where are these variants in millions of individuals? Sequencing individuals is expensive, genotyping super cheap, okay? So because most of the genetic variants in an individual are recurrent in the population, once they've been discovered and cataloged, it's very easy to just build a microarray that has two different spots, one with the you know, common allele or the risk allele, one with the protective allele, one with the reference allele or the alternate allele, anyway, one with each allele, and then take a blood sample from a person, run it on the array, and see which spot lights up better. Who's with me so far? Awesome. So that's super, super cheap. Uh, so DNA microarrays were, you know, uh, the way that we were doing gene expression profiling in the 90s. Now they're the way that we do genetic variation. So you, the fragments of the DNA sample containing SNPs will hybridize to array probes according to which of the two SNPs is there. And whether, you know, if you see them the same, you'd know they're individual heterozygous. If it's only one, it's homozygous risk or homozygous some risk and so on. Okay? So, you know, the way that all of GWAS is carried out, the way that 23andMe genotypes people, et cetera. So basically, you can study disease associations across very, very large populations, uh, you know, using the very, very cheap design. But for new populations like Asia, Africa, you know, Native America ancestry, you actually require new array designs that capture the population that was simply not there in European populations. Who feels that they've learned stuff? Yay, awesome. So um, let's, who wants a break? All right, 30 second break. Please stand up and stretch. All right, welcome back. So um, now we know these fundamental units. Let's talk about sort of where are these haplotype blocks coming from, okay? So every time a person is born, they are a combination of uh, mom and dad, obviously. But again, a discrete combination, not a blending combination, you only get to choose one version of each uh, paternal or maternal allele at every location. So it's really discrete inheritance. How does this happen? By basically, uh, you know, this chromosome is from grandpa, this chromosome is from grandma, or at least partly from grandpa. One version is from grandpa or from grandma, from one side, grandpa, grandma from the other side. You then get some blending 
that uh, sort of creates your chromosomes. And this blending is through these recombinations where every location you have either moms or dads from here, or sorry, grandpas or grandmas from here, and other grandpas or grandmas from there. Everybody with me here? Great. So parents basically share 50% of their DNA with their children, and siblings share 50% of their DNA with each other, but they're not the same 50%. And this is actually from my own genome. Uh, this is um, when my son was born with blue eyes and blonde hair and uh, very pale. I was like, oh, what a cute little Nordic baby. <laughs> and everybody would ask, hey, where's his blonde hair coming from? And I was like, well, probably his dad. Uh, <laughs> so my wife didn't take this joke so well. So <laughs> when my son was eventually old enough to be genotyped, uh, she sent me an image called paternity.jpg, <laughs> which is the image that I'm showing you here. And it basically shows that, yeah, this little blonde kid was mine. Uh, and as you all know, blonde is a recessive trait, so it's okay. And uh, there's so many other reasons I know he's mine. <laughs> anyway, uh, I love my kid and my wife very much. <laughs> so, so with that, uh, so that's why I figure credit this is my wife. Um, so anyway, this is an example of how I am related to my kid. So at every location of the genome, I'm exactly 50% identical. Okay. This is how I'm related to my brother. For 50% of the genome, I'm exactly 50% identical. But for a quarter of the genome, we're 100% identical. And for another quarter, we're 100% different, which again explains a lot about my brother and I. Um, so, um, and what are all these little arrows? These are recombination events. These are the, the breakpoints where my genome inherited a different version of either my mom or my dad. In this particular case, we go from sharing one copy to sharing zero copies, to sharing one copy, to sharing zero copies. And every one of those is a recombination event. Raise your hands if you're with me. Great. What are these recombination events? So recombination is a crucial uh, thing that has to happen for lining up chromosomes during meiosis and during gamete formation. If you don't have a recombination event, you will very frequently have non disjunctions where these chromosomes will missegregate. Okay? So, recombination starts with a double stranded break, which is then repaired by strand invasion, where you basically break one of the chromosomes, the other one comes to the rescue, they sort of line up with each other, and then this is resolved either returning to a blue blue and a red red or returning to a blue red and a red blue okay so recombination events are the mechanism through which um chromosomes line up and evolutionarily it's also super cool because we get to mix and match traits from our parents so every new baby that's born is a completely new uh version of uh, you know the com new combination of their parents everybody with me here so repair can basically lead to either gene conversion where a small chunk is repair is replaced and you basically have a small part of red inside blue or a small part of blue inside red or it can lead to recombination through this new allele combination of you know blue blending into red everybody with me great and this is thought to be the fundamental selective advantage of sexual reproduction basically the reason why we have sexual reproduction is because we can mix and match allele combinations from our parents. So our recombination does not happen uniformly over the chromosome. There are instead recombination hotspots that occur about every 100,000 nucleotides, and these recombinations occur hundreds of times more frequently in hotspots. And most studies have revealed uh, the role of a protein called PRDM9 in demarcating these hotspots. And that's where this tragic love story of PRDM9 comes in. So PRDM9 is a zinc finger protein that binds specific DNA motifs, methylases, uh, methylates H3K4 surrounding the binding site and recruits double strand break enzymes. PRDM9 is under strong constraint, but the DNA binding zinc finger array has very high mutation rate and is under positive selection. So if you look at the whole protein, the whole protein is extremely slow evolving, but there's one chunk of it, which is super, super fast evolving. Why is that? Um, the reason is that every time PRDM9 finds its motif, 
It loves this motif. It looks for this motif everywhere in the genome. And every time it finds it, it's tragic because the act of binding it, the act of making the double-stranded break, will kill the motif. It will now have to look for a new motif somewhere else. Okay, it's really tragic. It's like the thing of ancient Greece. Um, and that basically means that the motif keeps getting lost and therefore recombination will no longer happen. The chromosomes will no longer align. The lineage will die. So instead, PRDM9 accumulates protein coding mutations that change its binding specificity to find a slightly different motif somewhere else in the genome. And as soon as it finds that one, it's in love again and it will break it again. And it'll have to find another love. Everybody with me so far? Great. It basically binds that motif. It recruits the double-stranded break machinery. It cuts the genome, leading to the strand invasion and the recombination. Exactly right. Yeah. So, it, I mean, we, purpose is funny, but yeah. So you said there were hot spots every like 400,000. Yeah. Acres. And that's where the motifs are. Right. So these are like fluid though, like they change generation to generation? They change population to population. If you look at different populations, the hotspots are in different locations. There are 40 different PRDM9 protein coding variants, 40 different alleles, each with a different DNA binding specificity. And depending on which PRDM9 protein version I inherited from mom or from dad, I'm going to have a different set of recombination hotspots in the lineage that I give to my children, right? Who thinks this is all kind of cool, right? Okay, awesome. So the repair double stranded break no longer contains the PRDM9 motif, leading to this evolutionary competition between the protein and its motif. Sounds good? Everybody with me so far? All right, so what you end up with when you look at correlations of SNPs across the chromosome is a picture like this that basically tells you that all of these SNPs are highly correlated across individuals. What does that tell me? That basically tells me that they're co-inherited. That also tells me that there's no recombination event breaking that haplotype block, okay? So these are very similar to the pictures that we saw of high C, you know, sort of correlations across the genome. And they point to these hotspots here, here where the PRDM9 motif occurs. Everybody with me? So how do we quantify this uh, in, the, in the genome? So basically, the recurrent recombination events occur at hotspots, and the R-square correlations between SNPs depend not on how often, um, you know, not on some other event, but on the historical order in which they arose, okay? So basically, this tells me a lot about the history of all of these recombination events, not the physical order in the chromosome. So, you know, some things might be very highly correlated, but much further from each other than those two things that are not highly correlated. And the reason is that the historical order in which these mutations happen is uh, different. Sounds good? So we can quantify all that by basically looking at linkage disequilibrium. What does that mean? So um, it basically means that genetic variants would normally segregate independently that's the independent assortment that we talked about from Mendel. But every time they deviate from this independent assortment, we say that there's a disequilibrium, okay? That the two variants are not found with independent frequencies in the population, that there's some kind of linkage. Sounds good? So basically, linkage equilibrium, or LD, can be quantified by asking, how often do I find each of the alleles independently? or this SNP and that SNP? How often do I find zero or one here, regardless of what the other SNP is? How often do I find zero or one here, regardless of the other, what the other SNP is? And how often do I find both? And if I find both at the same frequency as I would predict based on the product of their independence, uh, of the independent uh, probabilities, then I basically say that they're in equilibrium. But if I find that that product deviates, I say that they're in linkage disequilibrium. Everybody with me? Great. So we can basically talk about these uh, values. And uh, this is basically the deviation from Mendel's uh, independent assortment law. And we interpret these values by saying, what is the maximum distance that I would have, the maximum deviation that I could possibly have? Because the allele frequencies themselves 
will basically tell you how much you would expect by chance. And that's why we have this value called V prime, which is basically that deviation that I observe versus the maximum potential deviation that I could have observed from uh, you know, these allele frequencies. So this V prime is very easily interpretable. It is what percent of the maximum possible you know, uh, disequilibrium that I have. Everybody with me? Awesome. So Linger's disequilibrium can also be measured as R squared, which is effectively the correlation with which we see these uh, things. Basically, R squared is a correlation for individual SNPs, and it's exactly the R squared of a GWAS association summary statistic for those SNPs, as we're gonna see on Thursday. So in practice, the Pearson correlation is very effic efficiently computed, and it is a very fundamental quantity that allows us to calculate C-scores. So this is really just uh, this D that we calculated earlier, squared divided by each of the individual probabilities, okay? So basically one way of normalizing D is to basically uh, look at the maximum deviation. Another one is to look at the individual product of the frequencies, which basically gives you an actual correlation. Everybody with me here? Awesome. All right, so basically the HapMap project cataloged all of these haplotype blocks. It basically said, let's understand the haplotype structure of the human population, the shared variation within and between groups of humans. And this is a fundamental knowledge that then enabled GWAS and so on and so forth. So basically they systematically cataloged 3 million SNPs across 11 subpopulations and then they inferred the haplotypes, these blocks of inheritance uh, across all of these individuals, okay? Here's what these haplotypes actually look like. As you scan along the genome, you basically have genes here, and then you have SNPs, all of these little red dots. And it turns out that all of these SNPs are inherited as a block because there's no recombination hotspots between them. There's one here, there's one there, but that whole thing is a block, okay? And then that whole thing is a block, and that whole thing is a block. So what does that mean? That means, of course, that there's relatively few haplotypes in the entire human population. Out of 10 million SNPs, we don't see two to the 10 million different haplotypes. That means that it's, you know, the, the actual diversity is much lower. It implies a very high level of genotype sharing, even for unrelated individuals. And it has major implications in the efficiency with which I can catalog all of the genetic variation in a million individuals. How? Because instead of genotyping every single SNP here, I can just genotype one of them or two of them and then get the whole haplotype block out of that, okay? So we're gonna be talking about the genotype of a person, we're gonna talk about the haplotype of a region, and we're gonna talk about a haplotype block or a linkage disequilibrium block based on all of the SNPs that are co-inherited in that region, typically between two recombination hotspots. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. So now you can ask, how are all these mutations accumulating? And the answer is, well, it depends on the lineage that you're on. As you can see here, most of them are very ancient. They all happened back in Africa, but some of them happened in more recent parts of the tree. And therefore, what you see, if you look at a whole region, is a background of ancestral mutations laid on top of, and, and, and a bunch of new mutations laid on top of that, okay? So these mutations happen in the context of ancestral haplotypes. Everybody with me? Good. So now when we think about mapping disease variation, the same thing that became a blessing is now becoming a curse. The linkage to equilibrium structure, the haplotype structure became a blessing because I could only genotype one SNP and then I had the answer for the whole region. But the problem is no matter how many SNPs I haplotype, I still can't figure out which one is the causal one because they're all co-inherited, okay? So fine mapping is the challenge of figuring out which is the driver SNP what is the, the causal SNP out of many that are co-inherited within the same haplotype block. And one way to do that is to basically look at functional information. You can look at epigenomic information. 
and basically say which SNPs overlap an enhancer in the relevant cell type. Alternatively, you could basically do your mapping in multiple populations, carry out the same genome-wide association study in multiple populations, and then rely on differences in the haplotype structure of the different populations to basically do genetic fine mapping. Or you could just look at a very, very large number of individuals and hope for recombination events that allow you to genetically decide which of the SNPs is the most likely cause of cancer. Everybody with me? So phasing of haplotypes is uh, basically now that we've genotyped individuals, we want to be able to phase these individuals. And phasing basically means inferring from this 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, where to put the zeros on the ones, on the mom and the dad side. And the, you know, these are easy. Basically, if you have a two, it's easy. If you have a zero, it's easy. It's the ones that are the problem because you don't know which one they came from. But you can then go and look at dad and mom and say which combinations are even possible. And in this particular case, I say that dad's genotype, not haplotype because haplotyping is hard, but dad's genotype is zero, two, zero. So therefore, that can't possibly have given me the one here. Got it? Everybody with me? So therefore, I can infer this part here, and I can infer, you know, these ones here because, um, you know, but 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 the ones that I don't know are the ones where both mom and dad could have given me their one copy of that allele. Sounds good. So that's sort of, uh, you know, the challenge of phasing. So. If at least one parent is homozygous, there's no ambiguity. If both parents are heterozygous, then you need to resolve the remaining ones using linkage disequilibrium blocks by basically saying, in the population that the parents are sampled from, how likely is that particular haplotype? So you can use basically the collection of unrelated individuals to estimate the frequency of each haplotype in every population. And then for any one individual, estimate the probability with which that uh, genotype corresponds to each of the different haplotypes. Everybody with me? So the same way you can impute genotypes to haplotypes for each, uh, sorry, you can phase genotypes into haplotypes for any individual. You can also fill in the missing information for each individual. As I mentioned earlier, we're only genotyping a small subset of the genetic variants across the genome, and we want to fill in the rest. How do we do that? By basically first phasing these genotypes into haplotypes, inferring what is the most likely haplotype that these genotypes were sampled from, and then filling in the missing information from that haplotype. Sounds good? And that's basically known as imputation. So that's basically filling in missing data based on the statistical correlations of the remainder of the data. So that's where we'll stop today. And uh, I hope you've learned a lot. Uh, basically, uh, we talked about genetic variation, a brief history of the, uh, how we came about to have genetics, uh, basic foundations of the genome, its variation, SNPs, indels, copy number variants, SDRs, how to detect them, and how to call variants from reads, and then the basic biology of where are these haplotypes and linkage equilibrium blocks coming from. On Thursday, we'll exploit those to carry out disease association studies. Who feels that they've learned stuff today? Good. Okay, see you guys on Thursday.